What's poppin', y'all? Welcome back to another episode of NBA Weekly. I'm your host, Pee Wee the Plug, and in today's episode, we're going to talk about the Phoenix Suns and what's next in their future after another disappointing round two exit. Before we dive into that, though, I just want to remind you guys, make sure you're hitting that like button for me, and if you're new and you enjoy this type of content on a weekly basis, make sure you hit that subscribe button. Now, Phoenix, 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 Phoenix. First and foremost, what I want to say is I know a lot of my subscribers and a lot of people in my community are Phoenix Suns fans. So I, w- I want y'all to be active in the comments of this video, Phoenix Suns fans, and let y'all frustrations out. Let me know what y'all want to see or what y'all think are the main problems is because what I what I see by working in the NBA is that nobody knows what's best for a team than the people in the actual fan base who sit there and watch every single game from the first of the season to halfway through at the all-star break to post-trade deadline to the playoffs. They know every story, every rumor, uh, the mood of every player and what they bring to the locker room or the bench or the chemistry. So Phoenix Sun fans that I know exist in this community, make sure y'all active and letting us know what y'all think are the real, real main problems that a lot of the mainstream media probably won't bring up because they really don't know but disappointing to say the least um just as a basketball fan who had no real dog in the race because obviously I'm not a Suns or a Nugget fan just trying to get some good basketball and when you see the first game of Boston and Philadelphia and how Boston was able to extend that to a game seven it kind of gave you some hope that Phoenix would be able to do the same at the least especially because Phoenix was at home and from the start this game was pretty much done in the first quarter. Uh, Denver almost put up 50 points in the first quarter, already out to an 18, 20 point lead. And it just gave you that same feeling of last year against the Mavericks where the Suns just come into a game and they have no fight at all. And you kind of prepare for that a little bit, just not so early in the game because there was no Chris Paul. He only, you know, we already knew that. He only played two games in the series. But then there was also no Aiden. Aiden was out with a rib contusion, um, and that was that was that was a little disappointing. Just just to be honest, with everything on the line, you know, this team has showed some fight after going down 2-0. They come back home and protect the home court. So it's like at the worst, we come back and we win another game at home, and we just got to try to dog it out at Game Seven in Denver. But that's just not what we got. And you know, there were certain clips of DeAndre Aiden on the bench and just seeing how. <laughs> He interacted and and how he was with his team down 20 plus points at one time, 30 plus points, um, you know, and and, and about to go home to see a guy, you know, just and and I don't want to sound like an old head. I don't want to sound like nobody is looking too deep into things. But because I've heard other people say it and I heard other people speak on it, it, it lets me know that I'm not the only one who was seeing it. Just some of the emotion, you know, the the, the silliness, the goofiness, the the, the laughing. It, it's just strange and odd, you know what I mean? Because a lot of times during that game, they would show Chris Paul and they would show DeAndre Aiden because they, they would speak on them being, you know, two starters down. And Chris Paul's demeanor as somebody who was on their way home and they're seeing their team struggle without them on the floor and thinking probably to themselves, I could be changing something. And then seeing DeAndre Aiden's demeanor. It was it was night and day and it was extremely telling. And, you know, I wake up today and we see reports of teammates now having the same type of frustrations that Monty Williams have had with DeAndre Aiden with his um, his lack of of availability and his aggression. I believe it was that they said um, it says that ESPN um, sources told ESPN that Aiden's teammates have shared their coaches frustrations with their what would perceive to be inconsistent effort and aggression from the seven footer, which has been something that's just been there. DeAndre's Aiden whole career was like his aggression and his effort. And if we look deeply into the series and we just being honest, there has been moments and there's been times where Jock Landale has basically gave them more from an effort standpoint. You know, uh, the game three that the Phoenix Suns won, DeAndre Aiden watched from the bench because there was a lack of effort there. And the Suns and Monty Williams felt they would be in better position with Jock Landale finishing the game. And they won. And I think from that standpoint, that's where the Phoenix Suns want to be. And that that's what I've said since they brought, brought him back on that contract where the Phoenix Suns prefer to play with somebody who's just going to consistently give them effort and do the little things. 
they don't really have interest in playing the way DeAndre Aiden wants to play and wants to be utilized, where he's getting post touches. He has the the capability of taking four turnaround jumpers or fadeaways. You know what I mean? They want somebody who's going to screen hard, crash the offensive glass, run the floor, and occasionally have a dump in when you can get a dunk and you just be happy with that. Kind of like the role that Mitchell Robinson plays with the Knicks kind of like the role that Nicholas Claxton plays with the with the Nets. They're looking for a center like that. You know how Tyson, I mean, not Tyson Chandler, I'm sorry, JaVale McGee was with them uh, last year before he went to the Mavericks. They want a, a, a dirty work, low maintenance center who's going to do a lot of the little things that are going to help you win games, like offensive rebound. To be able to get a guy that can give you five offensive rebounds in a game and give you those extra possessions when you have a Kevin Durant or a Devin Booker is going to be extremely lethal. Like I said, you look at a team like my Knicks um, who have a Mitchell Robinson, but we don't have a Kevin Durant or Julius Randle, I mean, or, <laughs> or a Kevin Durant. You can see the effects and how important it is to have those second, third, sometimes even fourth opportunities um, on the offensive glass. And DeAndre Aiden just hasn't given them that. He doesn't give them that defensive presence either. He's not a rim protector or he's not any anybody that's really covering up the defense. And it's disappointing because in his, ver in his very first playoff series ever, DeAndre Aiden was magnificent. And that's part of the reason why they were able to go to, to the NBA Finals. And, you know, you look at this run and he had in those 22 games and, you know, 2020, 2021, he gives you 16 points, 12 rebounds, 66% from the field, um, a block a game, like real monstrous numbers for a guy who was only 22 at the time. You know, a young DeAndre Aiden in his first ever playoffs was playing like a top five center in, in certain moments. And then the next year, last year, he came in and gave you 18 points per game and nine rebounds, and he shot 64%. And it's like, okay, you know, they had a disappointing end to the season, but there was a time in the Maverick series where DeAndre Ayton kind of saved them and, and gave them a new breath of life. And for him to come into this series um, in these playoffs, and he has by far the worst, this is the worst version of DeAndre Ayton we've ever seen as a pro, where he's giving you 13 points, 10 rebounds, and he's shooting 55% from the field this is a guy who was giving you 18 and 10 16 and 12 on 66 64 percent and he drops all the way down to 55 percent um and just super super ineffective three and a half fouls per game this is a guy that was never really close to three the highest was 2.9 in that very first year but now to, out of nowhere three and a half fouls per game you know is not not something you're used to seeing with deandre and he's never been you know you look at his career numbers of, of fouls per game Second year gave you three, three fouls a game, um, but since then, it's just 2.8, 2.4, 2.8, and now he just jumps up to 3.5. It's just like you're not even playing focus. You're just out here just fouling and, and doing all type of wild shit. Um, and then if we talk about the series to a T, DeAndre Aiden this series gives you 10.8 points and eight rebounds. He shot 57% from the field, which is somewhat better. And uh, an abysmal 40% from the free throw line. And then again, like we talked about with the fouls, he averaged four fouls a game in this series. And he played less than 30 minutes. And, you know, Jock Landell, throughout certain games, just beat him in the effort mark, uh, department. DeAndre Aiden is obviously more talented and is a better player than Jock Landell. But from an effort standpoint of doing the little things that we talked about, screening hard, rolling hard, um, running the floor, boxing out and just rebounding and getting some effort. He 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 really dominated DeAndre Aiden in, in certain games from just an effort standpoint. But if DeAndre Aiden turned his effort up, he easily is a is a twenty and ten guy on any given night that he wants to be. But for whatever reason it's super inconsistent and it's not just something that I see. It's not just something Monty Williams sees now. They're saying his teammates see it now. Um, and I think a lot more fans are able to see it. He kind of was just not present here this entire series. And I think um, that's going to be a problem and an issue for the Phoenix Suns going forward. You also got Chris Paul, who, you know, to a to a lesser degree, was absent in this series too. played two games. And when he did, he shot 20 percent from three. He gave you nine points um, a game, five and a half assists. And to a certain degree, campaign was kind of better. You know what I mean? Obviously, Chris Paul is a Hall of Famer. Obviously, Chris Paul has value when he's healthy. And these two games 
could be a lot different if we were able to see him play six games. The impact could be a lot more, a um, lot more greater. But campaign being able to shoot the three ball more, being a little bit more aggressive offensively. Um, by no means is he a better player than Chris Paul, but throughout certain games, he gave them a bit more life offensively because of the things he was willing to do as a three point shooter, shooting forty percent from the, from three. And also last night we saw campaign was <laughs> was the only guy that, that kind of came with it last night's game. So um, Phoenix has some decisions to make in that department. Um, I think DeAndre Aiden is a guy that they're going to have to really, really, really focus on moving. I just don't see him being able to come back, especially if uh, if if Coach Monty Williams is their coach next year. But yeah, campaign let them in scoring 31 points um, last night in, in 41 minutes. Seven and nine from three. Book had twelve points, um, and KD had twenty three. Book really disappointed with the performance, but not only with the performance, the fact that he didn't want to speak or address the media last night was extremely weird, because you're going to have to talk about it at some point. And Book is one of those guys who we know as a tenacious player with a lot of heart, um, a lot of fight, talks a lot of shit. So it's like, you know, you can't run from the action now because it ain't going your way. You know, especially somebody who prides himself as a Kobe disciple and, and, and one of those mama mentality guys. You got to face that light and face that fire even when things ain't going right. That's part of the mama mentality is to take that and find a way to turn it into a fuel for next year. Um, what you were supposed to do last year after the Mavericks went on y'all home court in the game seven and stumped y'all away with a 30 point win. Y- y'all were supposed to use that as fuel. And, and, and to turn it into a situation where that never happened, where at the least y'all came in last night, y'all fought and y'all just lost to a better team. But to lay down and, and let them walk all over y'all from the start was, it was extremely disappointing. You know, even with two starters down, I just didn't expect that from a Phoenix Suns team who still had Devin Booker and Kevin Durant at the least, which um, which I don't want to pile it on Devin Booker and, and Kevin Durant, because obviously, you know, the other three people that they're sharing, sharing the floor with is important. Because if you don't respect or have to respect um, Jock Landale or Landry Shamit, and you say, "Hey, we're gonna we're gonna let campaign beat us," if that if you're the Nuggets and you're running with that strategy, I mean, I can't fault you on that or fault Devin Booker or, or, or Kevin Durant. But that was definitely a disappointing performance, and you definitely want to see somebody like Devin Booker, who's supposed to be the leader of this team and the heart and soul of this team. You definitely want him to be able to go out there and face the music and be able to speak to the media and be a leader in a tough time because this is his team and um he sets the tone for them even with kevin durant being there kd um i I think they have to figure out the relationship between kevin durant and devin booker as far as how they coexist they had the magical moments in game three and four where they were able to just play out of their minds as offensive weapons and lead them to wins no matter what denver was trying to do to take them away um or take them out of the game but going forward, I think you're going to have to figure out a way to keep Kevin Durant utilized. There were certain parts in these in, in this entire postseason where Kevin Durant was just kind of in a corner for certain possessions. And I think that limited him. And it also, as we've seen, limited other players. Mikael Bridges is a guy that I thought was just a good defensive player, 3 and D guy. And I never thought that there was anything there offensively. And I thought it was his game doing it. I thought he didn't have the offensive or the capabilities to be an offensive weapon. But lo and behold, it was really just him being in a position with Phoenix where he was like Kevin Durant in a corner for a lot of the the situations. And we saw as soon as he was able to go to a place like Brooklyn to have a lot more freedom, uh, Mikael Bridges is like a totally different offensive player. So they're going to have to figure out something with that. I know that's a Monty Williams thing. If Monty Williams is brought back, they have to figure out that fold, whether it's Kevin Durant, whether it's Devin Booker, whether they are able to go and make a, a acquisition to put somebody else on the wing. They have to add some more depth to that offense to where you don't have anybody just sitting there, um, especially of the magnitude of a Kevin Durant. There should be a lot more actions and a lot more folds in the offense where Devin Booker and Kevin Durant can keep can keep defenses on their toes whether they have the ball or not because if you just got Kevin Durant sitting in the corner for certain possessions and he's not doing shit you you what you're not getting your money's worth in my opinion so that's going to be something they have to figure out Chris Paul Chris Paul is in a lot of years of his career he's older he's done a really good job over the last few years especially in in, in Phoenix um you know being healthy and being available for them because that was a big thing in his in his career um, when he got to the later parts of just staying healthy, those little tic-tac injuries that will keep him out for series, like we saw with, with the Clippers, him or Blake Griffin, 
you know, who was going to get hurt. It's some Somewhere in this in this playoff run, Chris Paul or Blake Griffin were going to have some type of toe injury or finger injury or a hip injury that was going to keep them out five games in a series and be the determining factor. I think Chris Paul um, did the right thing of going vegan and that showed to, to extend his life a little bit. But now here we are and he's dealing with a groin injury. And it came again. And because this team sacrificed the depth to go and get Kevin Durant, that put a lot of pressure on Chris Paul and his body because they didn't have too many options outside of him to go to. So he had to play um, and be available game in and game out, especially with campaign being hurt. They just had nobody there to play that role. And going forward now, you put yourself in a position where only $15 million of his contract is guaranteed to a certain point to the summer. And if you don't move him, you're going to have to take on $31 million of his salary, which is obviously not the direction Phoenix goes into. So I find it very unlikely that Chris Paul will be back as a Phoenix Suns member on his team. How that's going to work, I have no idea. I don't know what the market of Chris Paul looks like. They're saying that he could be traded and, and other teams could prioritize him as somebody that they could stretch and wave. And basically what that is, is instead of paying off his contract um, in a short term, you spread it and stretch it over five years and you only pay him what three million dollars a year to, to get that off instead of having to pay him thirty one million dollars in, in, in one year or, or so or fifteen million dollars. Um, so that's interesting. And then DeAndre Aiden, um, whenever you have the situation that, that, that he's going through with the entire Suns organization, they barely wanted to pay him the money that they paid him. Um, it took the Pacers to offer him a sheet for the Suns to match it so they wouldn't lose him for nothing to bring him back. And I felt that made their relationship rocky. Then it was start to the, 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 the this training camp, him and Monty Williams, and them not talking and people making a big deal out of that. We already know they had a rocky relationship. They still seem to have a rocky relationship. Now you got the teammates feeling the type of way. You got Kevin Durant in the building now, which is adding extra pressure to the organization to make something happen soon. This is a team that's supposed to compete for championships. When you have Kevin Durant on your team with Devin Booker, you're not a team that's looking to have a um, a window of like, oh, we're, we're, we're just trying to get bet. Like, nah, it's championship aspirations in the door. And anytime you don't meet them and anytime you don't even get to the conference finals, it's going to be a problem and it's going to it's going to go from within. And the only way that this team can get better to address the needs and the depth is to get rid of DeAndre Aiden along with Chris Paul, because from a money standpoint and a value standpoint, there's nothing else on this roster that moves you. When you look at this, right, it's only from from a, from a series standpoint, from a six game series standpoint, when you look at the Phoenix Suns. Only three people average double digits in this series. Devin Booker, Kevin Durant, and DeAndre Aiden, who barely met it. He averaged 10.8 this entire series in five games. Everybody else is less than 10 points. You go to the Nuggets, Jokic averaged 34. Murray averaged 24. Gordon, uh, 13. Bruce Brown, 13. Porter Jr., 13. Contavious Caldwell, Pope, 11. They got six guys over the course of six games, averaging double figures versus the Suns, who had three guys and one barely made the criteria. DeAndre Aiden outscored Caldwell Pope in the series by 0.1 points. Contavious Caldwell Pope, he outscored by 0.1. This is a max player, a center, and a guy who was the number one overall pick who y'all selected over Luca, Trey, Jaron Jack, like, that's crazy. I think it's time for DeAndre Aiden to go. And I think he's going to have suitors because he's only 25 years old. He got three years left on that contract. And maybe if there's a team out there who is willing to play him the way he wants to be played and doesn't mind him getting 12 to 13 shots a game and four of them might be little turnaround soft jump shots, he may go somewhere and get back to you know what we thought he could be, which is an all-star type center. I just think that he's exhausted with the Suns and how they play and how they want to utilize him. And they're exhausted with his effort and aggression because of how he's responding to them not using him the way he wants to be used. And I think that marriage has come to a, a point in the bridge or the point in the road where they just have to go two opposite directions. And in order, and I, I, we can doubt it, but even if DeAndre Aiden was playing better, 
I think this would still be the route to go. Because you're not trading Devin Booker. You're obviously not trading Kevin Durant. And there's nothing else on this team that allows you to get depth or to get better. So DeAndre Aiden was always probably going to be the odd man out unless this team was in the was in the Western Conference Finals and was a game away from going to the NBA Finals. And they just had this three-headed monster of Devin Booker, Kevin Durant, and DeAndre Aiden. But because that's not the case, and because DeAndre Aiden is questioned by everybody in the organization, and they never showed any desire to keep him outside of the fact that they didn't want to lose him for nothing, you have to go out and trade him. To the Pacers, who gave him the offer sheet, maybe the, the Spurs, depending on where they land in the draft lottery, if they can't get Vic. Um, Portland with Damian Lillard. Like, the Suns have two guys who really just need three guys around them that's willing to defend, make open shots, and and do all of the other little things. But as far as scoring and playmaking and, and carrying through the course of the games, you have Devin Booker and Kevin Durant. Kevin Durant, at this point in his career, you might have to brace yourself and prepare for him to miss 15 games a year. Um, but I think when it comes to the playoffs, if they have a strong, steady point guard and some wing players who are versatile on a defensive end who can switch and knock down open shots off of the attention that Kevin Durant and Devin Booker is going to generate, and if they have a center who's just willing to offensive rebound and block some shots and set some hard screens and be a roll option to hit on a dive this team is extremely different and then you add a couple more bench pieces who are more respectable um and 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 yeah this 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 team is different in my opinion that's my opinion but if you're dependent on landry shaman for 26 minutes um a game in the playoffs against denver to really to really do something magnificent it's gonna be tough it's gonna be tough and it's not saying that landry shaman can't because he obviously had his moments but I don't think that they envisioned themselves really trying to lean on Landry Shamit for, you know, for input. TJ Warren, I, I really feel like you didn't get much from him or, or Terrence Ross. Um, for for Torrey Craig to have the series he had against the Clippers and average 1.5 points in six games here against the, the Nuggets was a, it was a super disappointing. So they got they, they got stuff to do. Um, their their owner is aggressive. That's why I went out and get, got Kevin Durant. So I think they are going to make the moves. But if I was a betting man, I would take my money and I would bet that Chris Paul and, De- and or DeAndre Aiden may not be back on his team. And I would actually also watch Monty Williams. I just would. Two back-to-back playoff series and two back-to-back years where you get blown out on your home court to go home. It's not a good look. It's not a good look. Last year, they just caught you slipping. This year, though, acquiring Kevin Durant, that puts you in a position to never let that happen again. And then you go out here and you lose by 25. I, I just, I have, I have to look at that. I have to watch that. And, and I have to take that into consideration. And I wouldn't be surprised if the Suns did the same thing. I'm not saying he's going to be a guy that gets fired, but he definitely will be on the hot seat if he does not get fired. And um, this team has a, a very, very huge uphill battle going forward because this free agency class isn't necessarily the best, which may be good for them because they don't really need to hit home runs. They just need to get some pieces around them. Um, and something that's going to be on the horizon is maybe I don't know how he would feel. I don't I don't know the situation between them, but they may have to look in the Russell Westbrook department. They may have to, if I'm just being honest. Russell Westbrook is a guy who can carry a load for the for the games that Kevin Durant isn't there. Um, Kevin uh, Russell Westbrook had a much more better playoff run with the Clippers than Chris Paul had with the Suns, um, and he's going to be a guy that you may not have to pay a, a, a stupid amount of money to, and you could just bring him in. And I, I mean, I don't know, I don't know. Maybe they do a trade with the DeAndre Aiden thing and they get their point guard there. But because of the lack of draft capital um, that you traded away for Kevin Durant, the stifling rule means that the picks that you do have, you can't trade. Um, the second-round picks aren't going to do anything, and your assets are what? Darius Baisley? Um, Josh Aco- I, I mean, I don't know. I don't know. Um, the, 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 the Phoenix Suns' f- future up in the air, very bleak, hard to really figure out. 
Definitely got to show some love to the Denver Nuggets. A lot of people in the series came into the – I was one of them came into the series thinking that Phoenix was going to be able to do what they do, and they were going to be able to attack Jokic in a pick and roll, and they was going to have their way, and not at all. Jokic delivered six games. He averaged a triple-double, 34-10 and 13. Um, Jamal Murray has some very, very incredible good moments that we're used to to seeing from him, so it's good to see him back on track. I keep saying it. I've said it all year long, and I'll continue to say it. Aaron Gordon is probably one of the best, if not the best, role player that you could have on your team. Um, And then you look at Bruce Brown, the way he played in this series, magnificent. Michael Porter Jr. knocking down a three-point shot um, the way he was, KCP. This team is going to be tough, and whoever they match up with in the next round for the Western Conference Finals, uh, whether it's Golden State or the Lakers, they're going to have their hands full because this team is locked in, they're rolling, and they just handle business against the Suns team who have their issues. But um, even when they were at full strength with Chris Paul, the Nuggets was having their way, and this series was born because they was washing their ass up. Um, They won almost every category in this matchup. They outscored them, out-rebounded them, out-assist them, more steals, uh, Phoenix had more blocks. Denver had less turnovers. Shot better from the field. Shot better from three. Shot better from the free throw line. The only category that the Phoenix Suns outplayed the Nuggets in was blocks per game, five point two to three point eight. Can't ask for more. So, tip tip your hats off to the Nuggets, um, and credit them for what they did. Chris Paul, Aiden, probably on the way out. Um. That'll be that's going to be an interesting conversation and an inter- interesting viewpoint or perspective to see what exactly is the value of DeAndre Aiden. That's what I'm curious to see. What would a team like, yeah, what would San Antonio be willing to give up for Aiden if they don't get Vic? Is San Antonio the type of team that would want him? I was reading somewhere. Real quick, before I wrap up, I was reading somewhere that a list of teams that might be interested in Aiden. Where is that? They were saying uh, the list of teams could include the Atlanta Hawks. What would the Hawks? Could you get DeJounte Murray? Could DeJounte Murray be on a move again that fast? Capella? They got Capella, Aneka, Kongwu. Um, yeah, like what, it's some, what, what, would the, yeah, what would the Hawks package be? Um, the Hornets, the Hornets always are in a discussion for a big man, even after drafting a Mark Williams or whatnot. Minnesota Timberwolves is in this list and they have Rudy (laughs) and Kat. So, um, they're on this, in, in this list, Oklahoma city thunder, Orlando magic. I don't really believe the Orlando magic. Your front court is incredible, but Franz, Paulo, Wendell, I don't, I don't see why you would take a chance on a max money Aiden. I would just keep that core together. Portland. Jeremy Grant is a free agent. I mean, you have Anthony Simons. You got Shaden Sharp. You got a first round pick. Outside of that, though, the Suns definitely don't want use of Nurkic. Definitely don't. And then, yeah, you have San Antonio, the Pacers, and the Mavericks. I would be very, very interested to see the packages that those teams would put together. If you're if you're the if you're Phoenix and San Antonio hits you up, which you probably want Keldon Johnson. You probably what you asked for Trey Jones. Um who like who else? Romeo Langford. I, I I don't know what that is looking like. The Pacers. I don't I man, Miles Turner or do the Pacers just resigned him. They probably can't even trade him that I would know of. I don't I'm not even sure. Oklahoma City Thunder, they were good, but they were a young team. They got Chet as well. But they put Chet at power forward. They're not going to give you Jalen Williams. Where you don't Poku is not all you want. Um they got young players, Trey Mann and Lou Dor. I don't see I don't see the Suns really uh breaking their neck to get the youth from OKC. Char, even Charlotte. Charlotte is interesting. Terry Rozier, Gordon Hayward, um P.J. Washington, but I think he might be a restricted free agent, so I don't even know if he could be in that deal. Uh, but but Charlotte is interesting. Charlotte is very interesting. You maybe get Mark Williams in return. I don't know. Charlotte is interesting. I would put my money. I, I like the packages of off the top of my head. I like what Atlanta could offer because they have an abundance of of, of talent there all over the place. 
Um, I like what Charlotte could potentially give up and maybe San Antonio. But the Mavericks, hell no. Nothing that they is going unless you're doing a sign and trade with Kyrie Irving. That would be the only the only thing. And even then, you okay, you get Kyrie. And now you have again this three headed monster, kind of like Brooklyn, <laughs> and you have no depth. So if Kyrie misses fifteen to twenty games, Kevin Durant misses fifteen to twenty games, and Book has to miss ten games, you 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 were just putting yourself in another disappointing trio of situations. But yeah, the Mavericks, I'm not feeling anything that they could offer. The Pacers off the top of my head, unless they could add in Miles Turner, I'm not feeling. And Orlando, no. OKC, no. So I, it don't even seem like it's that many options. It, it doesn't. It doesn't. And we still got to see um, what happens in the in the draft lottery. Because if the San Antonio Spurs can get the number one overall pick, you can cross them out of this list. They ain't going to have no interest in DeAndre Aiden. So it's going to be interesting to see. Um Appreciate y'all tuning in as always. Like I said, Phoenix Sun fans, even if you're not a Phoenix Sun fan, if you just feel like you know what they should be looking for or you got ideas for Aiden or Chris Paul, drop them in the comments as always. I appreciate y'all. This is NBA Weekly. I am P with a plug. I'll see y'all next time. I'm out. Peace.